All right, Acts chapter 24 is where we're going to be today. We're actually going to be going through a little bit of 24, a little bit of 25, and all of 26. So, Lord willing, uh, we're going to get through these chapters. I hope you have your Bibles. If not, pull it up on your phone because I'm going to be reading a considerable amount of Scripture today. <clears throat> and just by way of a um, background to get the context, I, I need to back up a little bit. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been here in the book of Acts. So just for those of you who were already here to be reminded, those of you who are new to our Bible study to catch you up to speed, the Apostle Paul has been arrested in Jerusalem uh, for uh, preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. When, when Paul gets here to Jerusalem, he um, basically draws the ire of the Jews who do not believe that Jesus is the way to salvation, the Jews who believe that the law and obedience to the law is the way to be saved, they take issue with Paul and his message that salvation is found through faith in Jesus Christ, not obedience to the law. Everybody needs to understand that the law never saved anybody. The commandments of God and the law of God never saved anybody. The commandments and law of God were intended to expose our unrighteousness and to lead us to the righteous one, his name is Jesus. And so the, the justice of God is revealed in the law of God. And the justice of God means that we all get what we deserve, which is punishment and eternal separation from God. That's the law of God. And the law of God expresses the justice of God. But then there is the grace of God. And the grace of God is expressed through Jesus Christ. And the grace of God teaches us that we can have our sins forgiven through faith in Jesus Christ who died on a cross. He took the punishment for us. The justice of God was meted out on the cross in that Jesus took on our sin and our punishment, though he himself committed no sin, he became sin for us that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so we are given the choice even still today. You want the justice of God or you want Jesus? You can have justice or you can have Jesus. I will choose Jesus every time. I don't want the justice of God. The justice of God means that I deserve punishment and I deserve hell because of my sinfulness. But God in his mercy has given us Jesus because of his love for a fallen world. John 1.17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Well, Paul's going around in Jerusalem preaching grace and truth through Jesus Christ. And the Jews who do not believe that Jesus is the way to be saved, who pride themselves on the letter of the law, they see Paul as a heretic, and so in their anger, they literally try to kill him. But because Israel is part of the Roman Empire at this time, there is stationed there in Jerusalem a Roman garrison. The Roman commander sees this angry Jewish mob attacking this guy in the temple court area, and the, the commander dispatches his soldiers to arrest Paul, but it's really for his own good, to protect him. He's about ready to be killed by this angry Jewish mob. And so the commander has Paul thrown in prison until he can decide what to do with this guy. He rescues him. And while in prison there, the Lord Jesus appears to Paul. And I'm going to throw the verse up on the screen for you to be reminded of this from Acts 23, 11, because this is kind of the springboard for where we're going from here. And it says this, but the following night, the Lord stood by him, stood by Paul and said, be of good cheer, Paul, for as you have testified for me in Jerusalem, so you must also bear witness at Rome. Now, again, Jesus is telling Paul this in this appearance of the Lord while Paul is in prison in Jerusalem. So Jesus is saying to him, as you've been faithful for me here in Jerusalem, you also are going to be faithful for me in Rome, which means a jailbreak is coming. Okay? Because if you're in prison in Jerusalem and Jesus has just told you, you're going to also testify of me in Rome, you're getting to Rome because Jesus has just told you that. So what it means is you're going to be living, uh, rather leaving prison in Jerusalem and you're going to get to Rome. What it does not mean is that it will necessarily be a straight line. There will be some detours along the way between Jerusalem and Rome. God is going to make good in his word. But there will be some detours along the way that Paul knows nothing about. All he knows is that he's been promised and encouraged with this truth that as he testified for Jesus in Jerusalem, so he must also testify of Jesus in Rome. 
But what happens between Jerusalem and Rome? Well, little does he know. He's going to be transferred from prison in Jerusalem to prison in Caesarea for two plus years where he will stand trial two more times under false accusations, false charges, so that finally exasperated he appeals to Caesar, which is like appealing to the Supreme Court, and he's going to end up going to Rome to face Caesar there. So little does he know that between this promise of Jerusalem to Rome, Paul will be in prison in Caesarea for two plus years. He's going to go through two more trials uh, and having to defend himself against false accusations. Then he's going to get to go to Rome. But on the way to Rome, by the way, there's a terrible storm at sea we'll read about in future weeks. And the ship he's on is shipwrecked. And he clings to life and swims to an island in the Mediterranean called Malta where he is rescued but then bitten by a poisonous snake. It doesn't get better. And then eventually, about three years after Jesus made this promise in Acts 23, 11, about three years later, Paul will finally get to Rome. Now, why didn't God tell him all that he would encounter between Jerusalem and Rome when Jesus told him, hey, you're going to get to Rome? Why didn't he tell him all these other things I just said to you? Aren't you glad he didn't? <laughs> Aren't you glad that sometimes God doesn't give you the details because he knows sometimes we can't handle it? God will not always give us the details between point A and point B, but he will always give us the grace to deal with the situation as it occurs. And that's what he does with Paul. Now, in addition to these difficulties that Paul will face, more imprisonment, shipwreck, bitten by a poisonous snake, all this other stuff, God has also arranged on this somewhat of a zigzag pattern of his life what I refer to as divine detours. These are occasions when God has arranged these divine appointments where in particular God will bring people along our paths in order for us to share our story, our testimony, to help people hear the good news of Jesus Christ. That is also what the Lord has in store for Paul. That between Jerusalem and Rome, Paul will have the opportunity to testify to different people along the way. These are those divine detours. And I just need to say, as it relates to us, that our lives will be similar. Your life, my life will also have a zigzag pattern that we will not be able to really see or appreciate until we get to the end of our lives and we're able to look back in the rearview mirror and we can begin to realize how God orchestrated various divine detours for the purpose of using us to share the good news about him with other people. And we must be constantly looking and being ready for those divine detours. And we see that played out here in Paul's life. This is exactly what God does with Paul. Yes, God made a promise to Paul that he would get to Rome. And yes, God will make good on that promise. But not before other, well again I'm calling divine detours along the way where there are some specific people that God wants Paul to speak to, to share his story with, to tell them about Jesus. So while he's in prison in Caesarea, he's going to speak to pr predominantly five very influential people. This is all part of God's divine detours. The first one we looked at a few weeks ago when we were studying in chapter 24, it's Governor Felix and his wife Drusilla. Now again, Caesarea is the capital of this particular province of the Roman Empire at this particular time. Governor Felix has uh, now been assigned by Rome to be procurator or governor over this region. This is the same position that Pontius Pilate had previously held years earlier. But again, just to refresh our memories here, go back to Acts chapter 24, and here's what we read about Paul's encounter with Governor Felix and his wife Drusilla. So verse 24 of Acts 24 says, And after some days, 
When Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. Now notice that. He hears him concerning <coughs> the faith in Christ. <coughs> so God is giving Paul this opportunity to share about his faith in Christ. Verse 25, now as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, <coughs> Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. And meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given him by Paul, that he might release him, and therefore he sent for him more often and conversed with him. You know, he, Felix is hoping that he can get bribed, and so he keeps calling for Paul. Maybe he can, you know, slip me some cash, and, uh, and I'll help you on your way. Well, Paul didn't give in to that kind of thing. Verse 27, but after two years, Portius Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul bound. Okay, so there's a new governor in town. His name is Portius Festus. But Paul has had the opportunity to share his faith in Christ with both Governor Felix and his wife Drusilla. Now Felix has actually, history tells us, been recalled by Rome because of his propensity for bribes. And he's also a bloodthirsty governor. And so he's been replaced now by Governor Festus. This is the next divine detour that God is going to keep Paul in prison in Caesarea so that this guy can also hear about the good news of Jesus. We don't know much about Governor Festus. Uh, it seems in history that he is a very reasonable governor. Governor, he would have let Paul go free, except for the fact that Paul here in a moment appeals to Caesar. That takes it out of Festus's hands. Festus was the procurator or the governor of Judea, this province, from around the year 59 to 62 AD when he died. And here's a little bit about that encounter. Look in chapter 25 in your Bibles, Acts chapter 25, verses 9 to 12. Verse 9 says, but Festus wanting to do the Jews a favor, everybody's wanting to do the Jews a favor here, answered Paul and said, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and there be judged before me concerning these things? Now what's Governor Felix, uh, rather Festus trying to do? He's trying to get a change in venue because he knows if he can get this case to Jerusalem, then the religious leaders can take it back. He doesn't really want to deal with it. But Paul says in verse 10, he said, I stand at Caesar's judgment seat. Like, like you, you've been appointed by Caesar, Festus. I, I stand before you now where I ought to be judged. To the Jews I have done no wrong, as you very well know, for I am an offender, if I am an offender, or have committed anything deserving of death. I do not object to dying. But if there is nothing in these things of which these men accuse me, no one can deliver me to them. I appeal to Caesar. And then Festus, when he had conferred with the council, answered, you have appealed to Caesar? To Caesar you shall go. Well, Paul was a Roman citizen. It was the right of any Roman citizen when they felt like they were not getting a fair day in court that they could appeal to the Supreme Court and they could go to Caesar himself. And so Festus says, okay, so it shall be. But God's not done with some divine appointments because before Paul goes to Rome, there's a couple of more people that God wants to hear the gospel. Their names are King Agrippa and Bernice. Look further here in chapter 25. Verse 13, and after some days, King Agrippa and Bernice came to Caesarea to greet Festus. And when they had been there for many days, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, there is a certain man left a prisoner by Felix, about whom the chief priests and the elders of the Jews informed me when I was in Jerusalem, asking for a judgment against him. And to them I answered, it is not the custom of the Romans to deliver any man to destruction before the accused meets the accusers face to face and has opportunity to answer for himself concerning the charge against him. Therefore, when they had come together without any delay, the next day I sat on the judgment seat and commanded the man to be brought in. When the accusers stood up, they brought no accusation against him of such things as I supposed but had some questions against him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus who had died, whom Paul affirmed to be alive. And because I was uncertain of such questions, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there be judged concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed to, the, to be reserved for the decision of Augustus, I commanded him to be kept till I could send him to Caesar." And then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. And tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. So, Governor Festus gets a few visitors, King Agrippa and Bernice. And Festus just kind of gives Agrippa and Bernice 
the background. I got this guy here, and you know, his name is Paul. He testifies to this Jesus, the, who he says is risen from the dead. And the Jews, you know, have accused him of stuff, but nothing really that sticks. And, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm a little confused what to do with this guy. And King Agrippa says, I'd like to hear him for myself. Well, this is all God's divine appointment here, friends. Because God wants them all to hear about the good news of Jesus Christ. And so God's going to use Paul to share his testimony so that now, not just Felix and Drusilla and Festus, but King Agrippa and Bernice are going to hear the good news of Jesus. Now, who are these two? So this is King Agrippa II. He's actually the last of the Herodian dynasty. If you remember, if you know a little bit about your Bibles, there were Herods who served as kings. Now, Herod is a surname and it is a title for a line of people who served as kings but appointed by the Roman Empire. It's a little confusing at this time in Roman history. There's an emperor, that's Caesar. And then the emperor has different governors over certain provinces. That's Governor Festus here in Judea. And then the emperor also had a king who was a liaison specifically between the Jews and the Roman Empire. And this is King Agrippa. The Herods were often chosen and appointed by the Roman government as, quote, kings over the Jewish people. Now, they were appointed over the Jewish people because they had knowledge of Jewish rites and rituals. The Herods were not Jews. They were Idumeans, the Bible says. Idumeans are otherwise known as Edomites. The Edomites were descendants of Esau. Now, there were two twin brothers, if you remember, in the book of Genesis, Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the child of the promise of God's covenant, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob had a twin brother, Esau, and the children of Esau were known as the Edomites. So the Jewish people were descendants of Jacob. The Edomites were descendants of Esau, and so they were distant cousins. So the Herods were a descendant of Esau. They were Edomites. They were Idumean. But in 165 BC, they became proselytes to Judaism because of their close affiliation with the Jews. They practiced certain Jewish rites and rituals. And so in, in the eyes of the culture and the day, the Herods were Jewish, but, but they were Jewish by being proselytes to Judaism, not because they were born as descendants of Jacob. Okay, so they made then perfect liaisons for the Roman Empire because they were not really fully Jewish, so they would be loyal to Rome, but they had enough understanding of Jewish customs that they could relate and understand Jewish customs, rituals, and scriptures, and be this liaison between the Roman Empire and the Jewish people. So this is King Agrippa II. Bernice, mentioned here with him, is not his wife. It is his sister. His sister is Bernice. Their great-grandfather, was King Herod the Great, who gave the order for all the baby boys to be killed in Bethlehem during the time of the birth of Christ. That's their great-grandfather. Their father is mentioned in Acts chapter 12. Their father is King Agrippa I. He's the one who gave the order for James to be beheaded. James was beheaded because of their father's order. And then at the end of Acts chapter 12, after their father gave that order, it says that he stood taking the praise of the people who deified him. They venerated him like he was a god, and he didn't turn away their worship. And so in Acts chapter 12, it says that God killed him. The true God killed him. Okay, let me just read the Acts 12, 23, because this verse is delicious. Just listen to it. Just listen. So he's like, he's getting all these accolades. Oh, we praise you, King Agrippa. You're like a God. You're a God. We worship you. Acts 12, 23. Then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God, and he was eaten by worms and died. Isn't that scrumptious? That's delicious right there. It's like, God's like, I'm not sharing my glory. You take the glory? Okay, Pfft, worms for you. And, uh, and the guy dies. So that's the stock that these two come from. That's the line that these two have come from. Their dad was struck dead by God himself. You would think they would have some fear of God in their own hearts, but they don't. In fact, just giving you history, friends, two historians, in fact, more than two, but two that I'll name, Juvenal and Josephus, both write in history that King Agrippa, who we're reading about here, and his sister Bernice, 
were in an incestuous, an incestuous relationship. So when you read your Bibles and you go, oh, King, King Agrippa and Bernice, you read it like, oh, this must be husband and wife. No, they weren't. They were brothers and sisters, but they acted like husband and wife, okay? So that's, that's this group here. But here's, here's what's important to understand. And this group is important enough to God for them to hear the gospel. You've got unethical people here. You've got Felix who's trying to take bribes under the table. You got Festus, who's actually doing an illegal thing because he's wanting to change the venue. And you got Bernice and Agrippa, and they're doing an immoral thing. So you got unethical, immoral, illegal stuff happening here. And God says, and these per people I died for too. And they're worth hearing the good news of Jesus. So, Paul, you're up. And so, Paul is summoned to give his testimony. Tells us here in chapter 25. Verse 23, so the next day when Agrippa and Bernice had come with great pomp and had entered the auditorium or the theater with the commanders and the prominent men of the city at Festus's command, Paul was brought in. Now notice this with me. This is, this, by the way, those of you who go with me to Israel on the tours, uh, this is one of the places where we stop and have our Bible study in Caesarea in the old Roman theater. It's pristine condition. It's still there. This is the very theater into which Paul was brought to give his defense and to share his testimony. And notice here again how even though it says Festus has invited Bernice and Agrippa and it says commanders, these are Roman officials and prominent men of the city, it's really God who's arranged this audience. Because this is a divine detour, friends. This is the moment where God is putting Paul's life on pause. You're going to get to Rome eventually, Paul, but I got some people who need to hear about me. And so, Paul, you're going to be brought before this group, and you're going to be able to share your testimony. So here they come in. It says there in verse 23, when Agrippa and Bernice come in with great pomp. So you got to imagine this, you know, here they are in their royal robes and they're, and they're coming in, you know, in the royal regalia and, and there's music playing. I know what the song was. Country roads lead me home to the place where I belong. West Virginia, you know where it is, ladies and gentlemen, because these are brothers and sisters right here. That's what's happening right here. Come on. Come on. You know, look, you know, I'm from West Virginia. I can make fun of my people, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Webster County, West Virginia. I own it. I own it. There's a hamburg, rimfire hamburg, a statue in the state capital of West Virginia. I own it, so I can make fun of my own people. <laughs> what do you call 32 West Virginians when they get together? A full set of teeth, ladies and gentlemen. That's what you call it. <laughs> and they're my people. They're my people. All right, let's, I digress. Let's read on here. So, all of you watching from West Virginia, I love you. You're my cousins. All right, now. So, so Paul has been brought here for this moment. Now, look, I, I know I'm going to read a lot here, but I need you to see the whole story. It's Acts chapter 26, and then we're going to bring this all home because this is very important for all of us. I'm going to read all of chapter 26, so follow along in your Bibles because here comes the moment where, where Paul is brought in. I want you to see what he says here. So in chapter 26, verse 1, then Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. And so Paul stretched out his hand and answered for himself, I think myself happy, King Agrippa, because today I shall answer for myself before you concerning all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, especially because you are expert in all customs and questions which have to do with the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to hear me patiently. My manner of life from my youth which was spent from the beginning among my own nation at Jerusalem, all the Jews know. They knew me from the first, if they were willing to testify that according to the strictest sect of our religion, I lived a Pharisee. And now I stand and am judged for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. To this promise, our 12 tribes earnestly serving God night and day hope to attain. For this hope's sake, King Agrippa, I am accused by the Jews. Why should it be thought incredibly by, incredible by you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. 
and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme and being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. While thus occupied as I journeyed to Damascus with authority and commission from the chief priests, at midday, O king, along the road, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who journeyed with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me and saying in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So I said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen of the things and of the things which I will reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, Paul continues here, therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, but declared first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and then to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God and do works befitting repentance. For these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. Therefore, having obtained help from God to this day, I stand witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come, that the Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. Like you're crazy. You ever had people accuse you of being crazy because you follow Jesus? You're crazy, he says. But he said, I am not mad, Paul says. Most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, knows these things. For I am convinced that none of these things escape his attention, since this thing was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. And then King Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. You ever encountered those folks? And Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. And when he had said these things, the king stood up, as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And when they had gone aside, they talked among themselves, saying, this man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. And then Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Well, God has work for him to do in Rome. So he appealed to Caesar because he's going to get that ball rolling. But look, what's important to realize here is that God had these divine detours for Paul because Felix, Drusilla, Festus, Agrippa, and Bernice all needed to hear about Jesus Christ. So Paul stands and he gives his testimony. He shares how God saved him. He talks about how the Lord appeared to him and how he had been zealously persecuting Christians before that encounter, thinking he was doing God a favor. You know, it's possible to be so thinking you're doing something so right, but being so wrong in what you're doing. And Paul was convicted when he has this encounter with Jesus and he came to grips with his own sinful condition and he repents of his sin and he receives Jesus as Lord and Savior. And now he wants as many people as possible to hear that and to be saved also. Well, Festus reacts like, you know, you're mad, you're crazy. Agrippa says, I came this close to becoming a Christian, but you haven't persuaded me. Listen, God is going to bring divine detours along our path. And we have to have eyes to see those moments and we have to be faithful and ready to share our story, to share our testimony in the same way that Paul did. It's not by chance that you work with that particular coworker. It's not by chance that you move next to that particular neighbor. As Christians, we need to be always looking for those moments that God may in fact be orchestrating and designing for His glory. And so we have to be willing to share our story and tell people about Jesus and, and to 
be prepared to always give that answer, the reason for the hope that we have. This is what Peter wrote about in 1 Peter chapter 3. Always be prepared to give an answer to those that ask you for the reason of the hope that you have. So we have to look for those moments. Now, you know, some, some of you might say, well, I don't, I don't really have a, a great story. I, you know, I don't, I don't really know how to, you know, share my testimony. I don't, I'm not really good at leading people to Christ. Okay, listen, I want to put you at ease and help you to realize just how simple this is. And the first thing is, for you note takers, three quick points. Number one, success in God's eyes is not measured by results, but by our obedience. You, you, you can't say to yourself, well, I don't want to share my faith because people w- won't believe me and, and I don't know how many people would ever get really saved for hearing my testimony. It's not the results that matter. It's obedience that matters. Think about what Paul did here. These five individuals, very influential people that he spoke to, that he shared his testimony with, how many of them became converts to Christianity? None that we know. Not a single one of those five ever believed according to the Bible or according to history. But what made Paul successful was not the results, but that he was obedient to God to say what God told him to say, to go where God told him to go, and to share what God told him to share. That's what makes us, quote, successful in God's eyes. It is being obedient to be used by the Lord in the moment that he has designed with these divine detours. Look, Paul, when he would write to the church at Corinth, he said this in 1 Corinthians 3. He talked about evangelizing people, leading people to Christ, sharing your testimony. He said, I planted, but his friend Apollos watered. He says, but God gave the increase. And Paul says, neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the increase. We don't save anybody. None of us saves a single soul. That's God's business. But what he does call us to do is sometimes plant and sometimes water, and then God does the rest. And we don't know what it might be. We don't know when we encounter someone if we're just planting the seeds by sharing our story and talking about Jesus, or if someone else is planted and we're coming along at God's divine detour and we're watering it so that God then gives the increase. The point is we have to be faithful To go where God tells us to go, say what God tells us to say, share with whom God tells us to share, to be used by Him, planting or watering, and then leave the rest to Him. Number two, this is very simplistic, but it's important to understand God opens doors so that we can open our mouths, all right? He's going to bring people along your path so that you can actually talk to them, all right? Now, I know we live in a communication age where we just like to hide behind, you know, our phones and our computers, and it's easy just to text and to, you know, talk privately and anonymously. When it comes to the gospel, God actually wants us to use our mouth and actually tell people things. Now, I know because I've heard, and we all go through this, I get it, where some people are just like, I just want my life to be a living testimony. I just want my life, my life to be a living testimony. (laughs) Like, they will, you know, by, by our love, they will know that we are Christians by our love. Okay. Fine. I, I get that. And Jesus even said, by your love, they will know. But he wants us to tell people, okay? This is the great mandate. This is Acts 1.8. Before Jesus ascended back to heaven, he says, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. He wants us to tell of his goodness. And of his grace, we are, we are given and entrusted with the greatest hope ever known to mankind. To not look for those opportunities and to remain silent is not only negligent, it's disobedient. Amen. And may God use us to tell our story. And this is the last uh, point, number three, that's important to remember also. Every Christian has a testimony we're sharing. Every Christian has a testimony we're sharing. Now look. I get it, there are some dramatic ones and there are some not so dramatic ones. Maybe you have one of those dramatic stories, those dramatic conversion experiences, you know? You've you've heard some people who have those. You know, they're like, I used to be an ax murderer and, uh, you know, killed a lot of people and my my whole life story was featured on Dateline and uh, served the time for the crime, found, found Jesus in prison and now I have a ministry. Killers for Christ. Well, gr- <laughs> isn't that wonderful? And you know, you can hear that and go, wow, wish I'd killed someone. You know, and you can just, you can, 
you can start to think, I don't really have much of a story. You know, that's a real dramatic conversion story, you know. And then you're thinking to yourself, my conversion story, I was six years old in Sunday school, and I, I've really tried to live for Christ all my life. Who's going to get saved from that story, you know? I don't have a dramatic story. Let me tell you something. Your story is for God's glory because he gave it to you and use it for his glory. Because let me tell you something, the redemptive story of God, God's grace is no less valuable and powerful for a six-year-old child who receives Christ in Sunday school and grows up to live for Jesus consistently than it is for the convict who receives Christ in prison and gets out to tell people so. Your life story is for his glory, so use it for his glory and tell people about Jesus. Those are divine appointments. May God give us eyes to see the divine detours that he brings along our path. Because you never know whether you're planting or watering, and it just might make an eternal difference in the life of somebody. May God use us for his glory. Father, this is our prayer. Thank you for Paul's testimony, a reminder to us that everywhere he went, he freely shared his testimony. Whether people ended up receiving and believing it and getting saved, that's up to you, Lord. But he did his part. May we do our part to look for these divine detours so that you might use us for your glory, our story for your glory, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.